Gamificação é um assunto que, que te interessa? Espero que sim, porque é um assunto riquíssimo. Principalmente para a gente que trabalha com remuneração, que às vezes é um tema tão difícil, tão complicado de explicar, né? Então a gente pode quebrar esse assunto em maneiras mais fáceis de explicar isso para as pessoas de uma forma prazerosa. E gamificação é um caminho para isso. Ó, e esse mês de maio é o mês da remuneração, você sabe. Nesse mês a gente vai cobrir o Total Rewards, estamos aqui nos Estados Unidos fazendo isso, acompanha a gente no Instagram e no YouTube. E nesse mês também a gente tem uma promoção de 10% para novos contratos da Consulta Salarial, que é a maior plataforma de remuneração do Brasil que você precisa conhecer e agora é a sua chance, tá bom? Então clica no link que está na descrição ou aponta sua câmera aí para o QR Code da tela e vem conhecer a Consulta Salarial. Ó, preciso te dizer que essa entrevista aqui foi conduzida em inglês, então se você tiver nas plataformas de áudio, corre lá pro YouTube, corre lá pro Spotify para você assistir essa entrevista com legendas em português, tá bom? E aí você não vai perder nada da nossa conversa. Quem sentou aqui nessa mesa com a gente hoje foi a Cheryl Thomas. Ela contou pra gente sobre como utilizar, como a gente pode aprender a usar a gamificação em remuneração. Ela teve aqui uma palestra no evento, ela contou pras pessoas como que isso é aplicável, totalmente aplicável no contexto de RH. Você quer diminuir o seu turnover em 25%? Ela tem a receita pra isso. Então, esse episódio aqui é pra você. Antes da gente ir pra entrevista então com a Cheryl, preciso te dizer que você pode viver uma experiência imersiva como essa aqui. A gente tá no espaço da delegação internacional, então você vai ver a galera aqui no fundo, conversando, interagindo. E você pode viver uma experiência como essa assistindo o Quinto Dia Útil aí no Brasil. Pois é, dia 19 de junho a gente vai promover o Open House Quinto Dia Útil. Para comemorar os 30 anos da carreira, a gente vai abrir as portas, então, para a nossa audiência conhecer como que é um bastidor de um podcast. A gente vai ter quatro entrevistas ao longo de um dia inteiro e uma oportunidade única para você conhecer o time todo da carreira, para você estar tá com a gente nesse momento do podcast e também se conectar com mais 300 outros profissionais de remuneração e RH. É um evento presencial que você precisa conhecer, então clica no link que está aqui também na descrição para garantir o seu ingresso e se juntar a gente. Bora para a conversa, então? Hi, Sherell. Sherell Thomas, correct? Correct. Beautiful name. Thank you. There's a, a, a story about this name? There is no story about this name. Well, actually, there's a story about the name where the name needs to be changed. So, I've been married now for two years. Oh, Thomas. Out. There you go. But he's not Thomas. So, that's the funny uh -huh. story about the name. I have not changed my name yet <laughs> to reflect my marriage. So, I will say I am Sherelle Thomas Hodge. <laughs> And hopefully, when we do this again, I would have officially changed the name. <laughs> oh, nice. Congratulations. Thank you. Wow. Ooh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and as I told you uh, at, a, at the back, uh, like to speak in your language and to try to understand, especially your session that we love to talk about gamification. We have two episodes that we did in Brazil, like with a guy talking about this, and it was so nice because it's a huge tool to 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 build something different and to engage more more professionals so i think it's gonna be fun of course yeah i agree yeah and, and i think that that's something so gamification is something we do in normal life in regular life you know so that we are not not always conscious about it you know Absolutely. so yeah. when you bring this subject to a corporate system or a, a environment it's like the oh so i become I, i become more conscious about it and then i apply it in my context so that's why you are here to explain us <laughs> how can you do this better not only do this but do this better there you go <laughs> so love it well i think i agree with you i think because we do just think about our everyday lives. Everything is involved around kind of gamification and with AI and this evolution of AI, everyone's kind of getting into that. So I think my job from a corporate perspective, being a Total Rewards professional is figuring out how do we incorporate that into the workplace so that our employees can also be engaged and motivated because my families are big gamers. So I think of my husband who's a big gamer and just thinking of the hours that he spent. And so I thought about what if he could do a lot of his trainings and learning and development as a part of a game 
time, he would probably be able to do them for the full day <laughs> instead of kind of complaining about doing it. And so it's the same thing, even with benefits and being able, so in the total reward space, a lot of what I manage is compensation and benefits. And so trying to figure out creative ways for folks to really understand the information yep. because it's information overload. And so yeah. the gamification aspect of it makes it fun. It makes it challenging. And I think that that like great yeah. competition. So it's a good way for us to say, hey, yep. the first person to do A, B, C, D, you're going to go ahead and get some incentives. So it's fun. It's engaging. But then it's a way for us to really kind of hit home on any type of training, learning, or key fundamental aspects of the organization that we kind of want to drill down into those employees. Gamification is a way to do it because it doesn't feel like work. It feels yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> if we look at a kid playing like he's having fun and he doesn't want to stop, he wants to play more and more and more. So we're like, we need some, we have to learn something from that. Absolutely. Like, right? It's addictive. And it's addictive. And that's kind of what, when I think of implementing it into the workplace, that's what we want. We want it to be a seamless experience where mm -hmm. you're, you're engaged, but you're excited to do it. So you're thinking about it because mm -hmm. the platforms, the mechanisms kind of make it exciting. So uh -huh. it's not like, I don't want to do this. It's more or less, I'm so excited to be able to do this because yeah. now it's a uh -huh. fun and engaging environment. Yeah. yeah, you know, and there is also a fun fact about it because he's my husband, as I told you. Mm -hmm. And when he wants to relax, he plays games like he's working. <laughs> <laughs> For example, when he, he plays Paul World, World mm. that's a game, like a Pokemon game. So he has to organize the, the, the workers <laughs> right? so the, the creatures are working for him. So he's almost doing his manager job, you know, <laughs> during his relaxing time. So go. that's something interesting about games. And he's well. not even feeling it. Like it doesn't oh, even yeah. feel like work for you in your mind because I think the fact that it's a game and the fact that just the mechanism mechanisms, the ease, the display of it, it doesn't feel like work. So you can focus and do it for hours at a time without feeling. I just think when you add a game component to it, I just feel like it makes it light and friendly. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. think that releases kind of the pressure that usually comes with work. It doesn't feel like it's deadline driven and so head down. It's more like, oh, this is fun and I want to keep doing it. And I think that's with gamification. It kind of pulls you in. So once you start, you don't want to stop. Uh -huh. <laughs> When, when I, um, so I, I, I had an, um, a, a mentor, I, I, I made a mentorship, a career mentorship, and the woman that made, made, uh, that um, followed me, though, that um, teaching me, guide me, uh, guide me mm -hmm. during this mentorship uh, journey, she told me, what did you use to play with when you was a <laughs> child? Right. And I was like. I always played with, so, you know, so, um, office, office stuff. So I, I played like I was working. So uh, uh, with papers and, <laughs> you know, computer. And then I, uh, because the, 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 the key was uh, when you think about that, you can find your purpose. So what you you supposed to do in life. And when she asked, asked me about it, I was I was working as a child. So I suppose that was my that's my uh, life That's purpose. Call. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and interestingly enough, as a child, so I wanted to be a teacher. So growing up, I would always have my doll babies, my teddy bears. They would be in school. So I'm the teacher. Oh, yeah, I have yeah, my yeah. mom, her heels on. I'm wearing her glasses and I am. And then I fast forward to today. Well, I've been called to teach. So in my personal <laughs> business, in my work, everything that I do, it's all about teaching, consulting, coaching, and it goes right back to when I, I figured if I had really stayed with that, I probably would have figured this out a long time ago. But I kind of took some segues in between, but you're absolutely correct. Usually if we tap into what we enjoy doing as a child, yeah. that's usually where our purpose lies. <laughs> I know we have a session about this, but before I would like to to know about you, like because uh, some of the special things we have in podcasts is to understand about the story, about the people we are talking, and. Uh, are you living in Atlanta? I live in Atlanta. What does it mean, like YMCA of Metro Atlanta? Yes. Because uh, YMCA is, for me is just a song. Like, uh -huh. yes. We love yes. it. That was very confusing <laughs> for me during well, my research. Well, it is the song. Yeah. Before I started working there, I only knew about the song as well. But I mean, I did know what they do in the community. So the YMCA is really an international organization. So there are YMCAs all over the world. Okay. But the one that I um, serve is the one that's in Atlanta. So we have about 
24 locations, about uh, 3,500 employees on a good day because we do have seasonal staff. And so, and what we do is we really focus on mind, body, and soul. So providing services for the community. So we're a nonprofit and it's all about providing those services and resources to be able to help women, children, men, et cetera, with all things that are relative to their holistic wellness and well-being. So we have education programs for babies mm-hmm. all the way up to the ones that are about to go in college. We have gyms, as you guys know. So there are a lot of gyms. Most people recognize us for a gym. So we have gym membership where you can go in and you can meet with wellness coaches. We have tons of programs like safety around water for babies all the way to adults. We have lifeguard um, training and kind of CPR for anyone that may be interested just because, you know, you want to be safe. Um, we do everything from an educational perspective perspective as it relates to wellness for mind, body, and soul. And then to do that, we get great funding from the government to kind of help us be able to do that. So our services go beyond the walls of just the why. So you can find a lot of our services in schools or through third-party partnerships. And so I kind of do that in my day job. And then because I'm not busy enough, I'm also (laughs) the CEO of the Shirelle Group, which is a coaching and consulting firm. And so I really just work with businesses and individuals on career and leadership development. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so, so a lot of purpose involved. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I came here, so born in the Bahamas, born and raised. So all families there. I'm the only one in the U.S. I came to college, fell in love with a nice guy over there. <laughs> and then, you know, the rest is history, right? So I stayed. But I mean, I think um, when I think of purpose and just kind of, you know, this is not home for me. So I go through challenges of isolation and kind of feeling alone and figuring it out. But I think purpose is why I'm here. So I think my purpose and kind of what I've come to do, which is to really be a resource and to share and be as knowledgeable as I can about all things career, leadership, HR, and development, it's bigger than just the little island of the Bahamas. And so for me to be able to do that, I had to kind of come out of my shell and be able to, you know, be in the U.S. And, and it's worked for me. So I'm able to kind of share, serve, tap into environments like this on the podcast to be able to share, mm-hmm. attending conferences, and then doing these services as a business owner has really allowed me to serve. And I feel like that's my purpose, to teach and to be able to give as much of myself as I can um, before my time is up. <laughs> yeah. As a little Sherelle used to do. Sure. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know, this, uh, this weight, to teach like we are talking about games remember you were playing like this and you speak so light Uh, i was in atlanta i've I've been there and it's not like this because it's hard to understand people from atlanta and but you were different like i I think uh, as i told you uh like oh to understand english is not easy and i and i i think you thought like this, oh, I need to be more careful <laughs> with these guys. Oh, you normally this is- speak s- s- so normally and okay. it may just be like, because i'm not native to oh, that's good. probably what it is and so again because we grow up with really the queen's english as we call it which obviously yeah. we were under british rule being bahamian and so the english is a little different from um american and so i think that that in itself because i've had to learn to adapt uh-huh. because again being from the caribbean i have an accent so you're not able to hear it because I've been in America long <laughs> enough that I know how to that. come in and out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But when we get into the car, if you listen to our conversations, you will be confused. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> I don't even know what they're talking about. Is that English? Is it not? But I think because I, re- I recognize very early on in being in corporate America that pe- I was different not from the U.S., and so I would say certain words, and people would be like, I'm not too sure, and they would come up to me after presentations and say, are you American? I'm like, no, and then I realize it's because of, you know, how I say certain words or the accent, and so I've done a good job because a lot of my job is presenting and uh-huh. talking and sharing, okay. and a lot of my audience are from everywhere, so how can I really speak standard English, be intentional about not speaking very fast because in my culture, we, we sing. As you were mentioning before, if we're talking, it sounds like a song with a beat. <laughs> so I'm very intentional about that. But I think because of what I do, clarity is important to me mm-hmm. because my message is not going to resonate if my listeners don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have um, more questions, but of course we have a, a different culture. And if I'm going to some place that is not so good, you, you can say like Emerson, stop, you stop there. Right. Oh, of course, <laughs> but you are in Atlanta, and I've been there, and I remember uh, walking around that part of Martin Luther King. Uh, it's all 
it's so emotional. I'm from a Baptist church, and I remember I was in a worship over there. Mm -hmm. Many people singing was so like I don't know how to explain when you're goosebumps. Yes, <laughs> I was like this. So, and you are special for many reasons, and um, you have a, a great position. You know, like uh, you you know many things. You have like you told your all, all job positions you have, and you are a, a black woman. So, uh, what is happening here in America? Because when I was there, uh, Atlanta, I was in California too last year. But we have many homelesses in Atlanta, and. Uh, I don't, I don't understand, like, with, uh, w about the racism, you know, I, I would like to understand you, what do you think here, and um, I, I think it's the moment to, t to tell us, like... Of course. No, I mean, let's do it. This is why we're here, <laughs> real and raw. I love it. <laughs> I will say, so I agree with you. I mean, homelessness in Atlanta is on the rise. I've never, yes. so having lived in Miami before and then New York, this was completely different for me. So it was really kind of, like you said, overwhelming. It was mm -hmm. really touching, even to the point where I actually serve on the board of the Atlanta Mission, and their job is to end homelessness in Atlanta. So I'm really trying to support that effort because it's crazy. But when I think of just my experience and just being there, I think it's because it's the South. I mean, full transparency. So yeah. living in Miami, living in New York, where it was a little bit more innovative, and then again, I think really diverse, because when you think of... New York, Miami, I mean, it's a melting pot of everyone from everywhere, so you have no choice but to be diverse and kind of everything's innovative. It's not that way in the South. The South is predominantly white men yeah. who are kind of in charge of every, absolute everything. And so I think when you think of black people in general and then definitely women, it's just been hard, which is interesting because, as you said, the Martin Luther Kings, they started the movements yes. and a lot of it happened in Atlanta. So you would think, and now I will say, I do think from a job perspective, there are tons of opportunities that I've seen in the state that I don't really see elsewhere. And I will say from a, as a black female professional. I'm very proud of the fact that Atlanta has a lot of African-American professionals that are doing very, very well. I mean, six-figure careers and beyond, and you don't really get to see that in a lot of the other states. But even though that's happening, racism is still a real thing. I've yeah. experienced it in my 10 years of being in Atlanta, unfortunately. And then, of course, I mean, gentrification is kind of coming in. So with the rising price of everything that's happening, When you're just making minimum wage, you can't afford yeah. to sustain yeah. yourself. And that's kind of how poverty happens because, I mean, you think of the average rental home in Atlanta, you're talking about $1,000 to $1,200. And the price so, is still going up. Absolutely. And me being in a comp and Ben profession, I know that there are a lot of folks that don't make that. I mean, the average person is probably making $35,000, $40,000 a year. So then you're expecting them to be able to fund a lifestyle with that. That's not taking into consideration if they're a parent, if they get ill, if they're like, there's just a lot that we don't think about. And so, I mean, it's horrible. And then the minimum wage in Georgia, yeah. it's even lower than the federal minimum wage, which the federal minimum wage is slap in the face because, again, what can you do with that amount of money an hour? So um, it's unfortunate. How many is the federal minimum? I don't think minimum $7.15. $7. $7. It's, it's crazy. And, wow. and the state can have a uh, um, minimum wage lower than the, yes. the federal? Yeah. Or higher. Because if you're in a place yeah. like California, yeah, it's you know, they love the employees. That's more employee friendly. And so, of course, it's a little bit higher there. But in Georgia, it is lower. So depending on where you work and what you do, those folks are not making a livable wage. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's really, what do you do? They're doing the best that they can with what they have, which is why I try to share as much resources as I can and, you know, encourage people to educate yourself. It doesn't have to be a degree. Even nowadays, a certificate, uh, anything. If you have a skill, absolutely, can make can more money. Absolutely, you a leg up. And in the world of social media now, yeah. the sky's the limit because now you don't have to necessarily rely on a nine to five to pay your bills yeah. because the nine to five is not going to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm, a, uh, I'm seeing the cross and who is Jesus for you? Oh, everything for me. <laughs> so you started out by saying Baptist. So I grew up Baptist as well. I mean, currently I go to a non-denominational church, but I grew up Baptist. And 
Jesus everything for me. I think of, so one of the things that I hear all the time when I'm in doing anything that I do is just as you said before, like you speak so well and you're so courageous and confident and it's really because of Jesus. It's really because I understand who I am as a believer and who I am as a child of God. And so because of that, I feel unstoppable, literally with any and everything. So I'm not afraid to try. I'm not afraid to fail, <laughs> but definitely I will walk into any environment optimistically and I truly feel like I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I try to do all things. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So I think we need to hear this because it's such a difficult task, you know, to be in front of these cameras <laughs> and talking in another language and interviewing people that you you never met before, you know. So it was the first time we saw each other. Right. And you are so kind and so Thank open, you. you know, you made us feel so confident. And I think it's very, uh, very Uh, important to bring this subject to the to a podcast like this because all the people that are hearing us, watching us, and thinking, oh, it's such a um, it's such an experience to be in the USA and covering this event and talking to people, knowing people, and it's it's really nice to to have this perspective. You know, absolutely. I all... think our differences really is what makes the world a better place. I mean, mm -hmm. that's how I look at it. Even leaving home, I think of all of the people that I've met. I've met some of the most interesting. I mean, I've learned so much, but most of the people that have shown me the most love, the most support, they were strangers. They weren't yeah. people that I knew. They weren't family and friends. They were people that just saw a person that was just kind of looking for help and they kind of took me under their wings and to your point now today, they're some of my best friends. Mm -hmm. But it's all about experiences and kind of jumping into the unknown and I've always <laughs> been that way from a child. <laughs> I've mean, always been interested in learning new things and trying new things and meeting new people, which is why I love traveling because mm -hmm. you get to experience so much and you realize the world is so different. It's yeah. so different. But we're all the same. It's different, yeah. but we're all the same. Yeah. <laughs> and we all like to play. So. <laughs> Absolutely, right? Which is why gamification is key. Yeah. So I think everyone loves it. I, I feel um, very happy to meet um, someone like you that works in a total rewards field and things like that because I think... Um, we need. It's your first time here, but in this podcast, normally we don't talk about usual things, HR usual things, you know. So we uh, we know how to begin the conversation, but it ends. We don't know where, you know. <laughs> so, but that's intentional. Box, like. But that's, that's not something that we do so unresponsibly. Lead. It's it's intentional to bring subjects that are not di directly connected to the HR field, so people can understand that we are mm -hmm. complex, mm -hmm. complex human beings. You of know, so. yeah. <laughs> of course. But actually, talking about gamification, I have a question for you. Of course. So, how is to bring this subject to a total reward um, environment? like this, for example, or in your uh, daily work. So how did you came to this point, you know, about talking about gamification? Of course. I think it started, so everything, as we know, starts with a challenge, right? <laughs> so it started with us just being challenged with getting our employees to engage. So we did an engagement survey. Unfortunately, employees say that they're, they're not engaged. And so my job as a total rewards person is to kind of figure out how can I move the needle on those numbers. And so we started by having focus groups just to sit down with our employees and find out what's working, what's not working. So mm -hmm. in my space of benefits, and if you know anything about U.S. benefits, It's, it's it's a lot. So legally, most organizations are required to offer medical benefits to their employees. And then most of them offer a slew of different. So you have, you know, maternity leave. You could have paternity leave. You can have medical, dental, vision, um, life insurance. Like there's so much. And depending on how big the organization is, there's just a plethora of things. And so trying to get an employee on their first day to come in and understand, and to your point, not all of them are native to America. So just coming in and understanding like 401ks, I'd never heard of a 401k. I came, my country has pensions. We don't have 401ks. So just trying to understand what's a 401k. Well, what is a high deductible health plan? I've never heard of that. My country has universal health care. Mm -hmm. So there's no need for, there were so many different things. And so I think about how confused I was and I'm a sharp cookie. So imagine a new person coming in and trying to understand and figure out. And we're like, well, they're not engaging. Well, they're not engaging because they don't understand. And it's really information overload. So my job was to figure out how can we make this more palatable? 
because it's not in the current state. And so I think AI changed everything for us. So we had always been trying to find solutions to make things more engaging. And then with the evolution of AI and kind of all of the research that's been happening from, psych from a psychology perspective to understand why we're so addicted to gaming, it just totally made sense. And so I learned about it doing my own research and LinkedIn learning courses and just kind of finding out, which led me to kind of reach out to those providers and say, hey, I would love to do something like this with my organization. Can we have a one-on-one -on -one for me to talk about my challenges and what, and then when that was successful, then the job was to spread the word, which is why I'm here, because there are tons of HR and comp professionals who are, they're struggling with, how do I get my employees to complete their trainings? They're mandatory. How do I get them to engage with our benefits? Because we spend so much money trying to offer medical, dental, vision, even family benefits. And a lot of employees don't tap into them because they don't know, again, information overload. So my job is to figure out how do we make it fun? And since I think I've cracked that code, I wanted to share that with professionals who deal with this on a day-to-day. -day. And I can tell from the questions that I've had after my session that we do have a lot of folks to deal with it because most of the questions were around how do you implement and then what programs did you actually use um, to get started, which tells me that there is a desire to get there because it's oh, just, yeah, sure. I mean, most of us have... ADD, I think of myself, right? I can probably <laughs> concentrate maybe 20, 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. And when you start to get over that, it's hard. So the gaming part of it, it allows them to kind of the be one, immersed. One, two, five hours. Point there you go. Yeah. Absolutely, right? So now I can throw all of my training modules to your point. So let's say I have a new manager coming on board. I want them to learn. They have to learn our company culture. They have to learn our values, our mission, all the different departments wow. that we have, all the language, because you know, every institution has mm -hmm. their own language. Yeah. And so you come in and you hear all of these terms that you low hanging fruit. <laughs> and you're like, a low hanging fruit? Is there a fruit tree in the break room? <laughs> you know, so you're trying to figure all these things out. So I feel like the gamification made it easier because to your point, there's even like we created a game where you can learn those terms. Yeah. So you're actually pretending as if you're on a journey but the journey is you're uncovering through the treasure chest all of these words and then when you unpack them we tell you what the meaning of it is and so yeah. you realize at the end of it that we have a whole language going on within here but this is a great way for our employees to be engaged and they don't put it down like our participation rates are 95 percent which tells me wow. nine five or wow. nine five very good absolutely because everyone it, it's fun and then we incentivize so that's the part that i don't want to leave out i think when you think of anyone, even including myself as a leader, there's always an aspect of what's in it for me, right? Everyone wants to know how is this going to benefit me? Like, am I getting something out of it or not? And so I think for us, we've been intentional about incentivizing. So it's not just throwing the gamification at you, but yeah. then what are our incentives? And it needs to go beyond just a gift card. <laughs> not everyone wants a gift card. Um, some people don't really want anything that's tangible. It could be a career opportunity. It could be lunch with the CEO. It can be a parking space. You know what I mean? Like it's oh, yeah. so many different things outside of just the standard, here's a gift card, here's a gift card. Now some people do um, love the gift card, but then I think just trying to think of how do we mix it up with the incentives makes a huge difference. And sometimes it works even better than money because you know, when you uh, provide an experience for the employee, like a trip or a gift card, sometimes he might do something it wouldn't, in, in another context, like uh, if I have to spend my money on this, I probably wouldn't. So if, if the company provides an experience like that, besides the gamification, you can have like a lasting Absolutely. You know, effect of that. And they'll tap in. Agreed. We did this. Like we have uh, that all that compliance legal lease and we put a stand up with oh, yeah. uh, comedian. a comedian. comedian. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> like to understand, like if you need to understand and to, of course, I don't read to all of these legal as I mm -hmm. told you, but so, but with the, the stand up shows, like there was a famous guy in Brazil doing that. We have, uh, we had, I think, seven videos like doing this mm -hmm. process to understand and was nice. And then at the end, there was a test, uh -huh. nice. and the <laughs> test was looked like a ca Kahoot, Kahoot. Like, mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. you heard? Yeah, a Kahoot during that uh, the the last of uh, the end of the year, we were were in a congress like right. this with all the company doing this kind of Kahoot and let's do let's do this question and it was not so hard. Like it was so funny because right. all these guys was laughing about this. So yeah. this is the magical part. Yeah, I I, I had a like before this. Why do human beings play? 
Mm. You are doing some researches. I think you have a uh, base to tell about this. Mm. <laughs> Good question. And I think you've hit it when you said it before. I think it's the experience. That is exactly what it is. It's being able to take yourself out. So if, even if you think of AI, you think of the metaverse and all of where we are now, it's you being able to live whatever, however, whenever, all those things that you've been dreaming of in your mind, you can now make that a reality. And who doesn't want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all have things that we wanted to do or maybe think that we should be doing, but I think getting into gamification and AI allows you to kind of tap into what that could potentially be like and then maybe decide, hey, this is something worth pursuing, or maybe not. So I think the fact that it is an experience, and it's an experience outside of reality, yeah, that's what it is. I mean, I think it's just the unknown. So you're kind of tapping into a, I don't know what to expect with this. It's a mystery, and I think that in itself gravitates towards humans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like a way to emulate what we do in real life. So, for example, it's difficult to understand what we do when we are living in it, you know, so... It's difficult to see way out, for example, when you are going through a, a difficult situation. So, but when you advise a colleague, it's much easier to advise this colleague than to get out of your your own situation. Of course, <laughs> it's like this with games. So we can emu emulate the the reality. Of course, and then you think of winning. I mean, we're all wired. We want to win. So that's the game part of it. It's almost like a conquest. So you're on a challenge. A you're doing Absolutely. And so just that's inherent in us as, as individuals, you know. So we want to be the best. We want to win. And I think just knowing that you're on this course and it has an end, I think that that's what really draws you in. And that's what I kind of love about just us as humans is that that tenacity to not want to give up. So the reason why your husband <laughs> or kids are just, they don't move, is because the next level. There's that anticipation, I want to get to the end, but not only get to the end, I want to be able to win. <laughs> like that's the goal of this. I want to kind of turn the game over and win it over. And so I think it's a desire in all of us to just be competitive and to kind of want to get to the end. And so when you put it in a gaming um, system, then it's not work and it's not just, okay, I have to do five trainings. It's, oh, I don't want to really lose at this because now I'm viewing it as a game and not necessarily a work and then we work hard at it because we want to be able to conquer it but then do a good job at it so I think it just it's just within all of us even as kids we've been and I don't even know now that I'm thinking about it I think there's just something about that competitive nature that we're not necessarily taught but it just stands out and I think about it since I have siblings that we were always competitive but I don't know where we got that from yeah. <laughs> but it was always the okay if she got a degree, then I'm going to get the degree. Okay, you're doing sports, then I want to do sports. So it's kind of that competition that's good, healthy, and I feel like that's what gamification does. It kind of makes us think that we can do and be anything that may be different from our reality. Yeah. As professional HR, uh, we are always looking for turnover. And on your presentation, I see that you mentioned that there was a 25 reduction in turnover after uh, implementing gamification. How does that happen? How does that work? <laughs> I think that, that interests a lot of people. Of course, <laughs> of course. So I think for us, it was really figuring out what are the reasons that folks are really leaving? Mm -hmm. Like what's happening behind that? And so we started with exit interviews, which is very important. So we did exit interviews as well as stay interviews. So exit okay. interviews are our folks that are leaving to say why. Like what is it? that's making you seek employment elsewhere. And then of course, for the people that are staying, so we have folks that have been with us five, 10, 20, 25 years. What is it about the job that makes you stay? What we realized is that it was the connection and the collaboration. The folks that had been with our, with our company for a long time and had built those relationships and bonds and had mentors and coaches, they enjoyed the experience. The ones that were fairly new that came in, they would be leaving literally after a year because we didn't have a mentorship program. We didn't have a way for them to collaborate with other teams. So they were completely removed from the mission. So if you think of even what I do as a professional, it's hard for me since my job is I'm in an office setting and I'm serving, but I'm in an office. I'm not on the front lines with the people that actually do the work. So. I don't get that same sense of gratification because I'm not doing the work. I get it from serving them. And so the people that were doing the work kind of felt the same way. They're like, well, I'm a part of this, but I don't really feel a part of this. And most people who join a nonprofit, it's because of the mission, because you're not going to get rich if you, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? you join it because it's the mission. And so what we found out is that they weren't connected. 
gamification allowed us to connect because with them being dispersed and we're in a hybrid environment, not everybody comes into an office, we can't really foster collaboration face-to-face -face because face-to-face -face is gone. Now the COVID came and we're like, nope, there's no more face-to-face. -face. So gamification allows us to still have friendly collaboration, friendly competition, learning, continuous learning in an environment with other folks within the organization that now makes them feel a part of. So our entire new hire orientation experience it's a game. So now you're going through this, but you're going through this with someone in marketing, someone in sales, mm -hmm. someone who's on the front line. To your they're point, all learning together. They're all learning. We're sharing stories, and to your point, we make it personalized. So it's not just it's not just all about the work. Just as you mentioned before, you may get to a level one, and then when you unpack, it's all about you sharing something personal. So, are you a mom? Are you a dad? And this is how we kind of learn and. It, we develop conversations and then at the end of it, those same cohorts that kind of went through this game, okay. experienced together, they build a bond that's now lasting. So now mm -hmm. even when they go to their other locations, it's still, oh, I know Sherelle who's at the corporate. Oh, I know Bob and Bob is in marketing. I know Rashawn and he's in sales. So it's easier now because we've gone through this experience together. So the purpose of the game is not only to teach the you know, benefits and stuff, but also to create bonds. There you go. Okay. Yeah. It's true. It's really for us, it was twofold. It was, we do have these objectives that we want our employees mm -hmm. to meet, which is doing their trainings, completing performance reviews, like all of the fun stuff. But for us, it was really, this is more of a sense of inclusion and belonging for us. How do That's we make nice. our employees feel like they belong? And by doing it, this is the platform. And it, it truly worked. I mean, literally, even, I mean, they've done some things beyond even what we thought, like just creating their own internal competitions and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work mm -hmm. literally by themselves, just because it's engaging. So it's kind of like, what level are you on in marketing? I'm like, mm -hmm. level two in training. Oh, we're in level four. So now marketing feels like I have to catch you up so that we can be on the same playing field. So it yeah. really, I think for us, we did see um, all of the legalese happen, so they are doing the training, but that really wasn't the goal. The goal is folks enjoy being a part of the organization, and that matters. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard about an app, app called Duolingo? Duolingo, Duolingo. is is worldwide. I, I think it's, uh, it's to uh, it's to learn some language. Like if you want to, to learn about Spanish, you mm -hmm. go to this app. But uh, I'm tell, uh, talking about it because. Uh, it it has a, a good gamification. You have like a lot of uh, tools and stuffs and gifts and all the times you are looking for. You are aligned like you are. You are in a competition, but it's not. Be, it's not about uh, become a winner. It's about like learn more of and course. more. And the more it, you it, learn, it, yeah. But it you, you, on. Yeah. Because my mother-in-law, uh, his mother. Yeah. Uh, she's addicted to it. Yeah. And when she sleeps and when she wakes up, she she always is there is uh, a special competition for these she, she moments always, like right. when you wake up and <laughs> someone While I passes was sleeping, her. Yeah. Someone passes me. Yeah. <laughs> so this person should be sleeping you know. as well. No. So see, <laughs> that happens with teams, right? That happens with teams. And even now that you said that I even think of like a Bible study app that I have. Yeah. Same thing. Like I I'm a gamer, and so I'm doing that. I use your version like there people you go. Is. And I introduced that to kind of my husband, and I'm like, you know, because he's like, oh, I don't like reading. I'm like, listen, you got to try the app. And <laughs> I mean, I had to literally take my phone from him and say, can you download it on your phone so I can have my phone back? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, this is uh, a good concept. I was uh, uh, I was watching a session with uh, Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek? Sinek? Sinek. Sinek, yeah. And he was talking about infinite games. That when you see Duolingo or when you see Euro games, uh, you you have infinite games because it's not about like become a winner. You don't have uh, a competitor. You have a rival. And the rival is someone that push you, mm. not someone that you can beat. Right. So this is the point that I think games like this could be uh, properly to companies because you were telling me things like that you know it's not about to kill other one right. is let's go because marketing sales yeah of course we fight a lot but <laughs> in this situation need to be colleagues with this only unique like one proposal to go no Absolutely. and you agree with it i agree with you and i do think that there's a sense of pride that comes in that 
And that's probably why, just like you said, that's why <laughs> your mother-in-law loves it because you're challenging yourself. Yeah. And that's a sense of accomplishment to know that, oh, I did this level. And to your point, even though it's friendly that someone else beat me and I'm not necessarily trying to beat someone, yeah. but I'm pushing myself and I realize that I did learn, I did grow. I like can I do am better. a step better than I, exactly. And I think once you get in that momentum, it's hard to stop. That's the thing about it. That's where I think the addiction comes in. It's once you start getting into the momentum of, oh, I can do that. I did do that. Now you want to do more because <laughs> you've done it. Yeah. And when you think about having an enemy, it's not necessarily a person because it could be a thing. For example, if I want to study, uh, not studying <laughs> could be my enemy, you know. So I'm not a studying person. That could be my enemy. So the, the, a thing that I, I don't want to become. So uh, I think that when you, you put this mindset in a corporate environment, for example, you don't need to have necessarily an enemy that's a person, that's a, an area. So it's probably so something that you don't want to become, for example. Of course. Thinking about what you just said, which that was a good point, now that I'm thinking about it, that could probably be the same with training. And like a lot of folks don't like to read. So when you think of how we have the materials, okay. there's not a, a lot of different ways for you to get it. It's, it's a lot of reading. It's just a manual or a guide that just has fine print and you're reading through it. So if you think of a person that may not like to read, that may be their enemy. So it's not that it's a person. It's just that, oh, my God, it's going to take me like hours to sit, to read, to digest. And so mm -hmm. that's a struggle. Yeah. <laughs> Very real thing. <laughs> what about the productivity boost that you had? I'm how, sorry? How, the productivity boost. You mentioned like a productivity boost in the presentation. Of course. How, how did that happen? Um, I, and so how, how do the you... experience. So I think once the experience happens and folks are going through it and being fully immersed in it, it kind of results in rejuvenation. Okay. So even for yourself, if you think of, you know, there are some times when you have some resets at work and it could be. So you mentioned Simon Sinek, who's one of my favorites. And so mm -hmm. I'd love to meet him one day. So I think of like his quotes and his books. And it, there's a lot from a leadership perspective that he has given me a reset. And with that reset, I kind of came re-energized. It's almost like same work same person but now kind of a renewed energy of what the purpose is that's what I think happens with the gamification so it's almost as if you had someone that was just going through the motions I'm showing up at work I'm doing my job but now that I get to engage and collaborate and have kind of that community it's not just a job mm -hmm. it moved from a job to now these this is my community this is family and you know we treat family different than we do strangers right oh yeah of course. so now that it's family I don't mind going above and beyond for you now that it's family I don't have to watch the clock and it's five o'clock mm -hmm. I'm done no because think about it when you think of family we go above yeah. and beyond and we do, so it's the same environment so now we went from an environment where everyone's clock watching and it's like I'm gonna do my 40 hours and I'm out of here to now I'm not thinking about it as work. I'm thinking I'm doing this for a person who is now my person. So I'm not watching the time. I don't, I don't care about it. I don't, yeah. We're going to all just do what we need to do to get it done. And that was different because in the beginning, it's a job. It's not I'm doing this to serve my peers. It's no, I'm coming to work. And when work is done, I'm doing it. And I'm, I probably won't even do a great job at it. But now when I think of who I'm doing it with and who I'm doing it for, because now they identify with the purpose and the community, it's a whole different sense of productivity. I agree. How did you measure the, the improvement in productivity? What, what types of uh, KPIs do you keep for? Surveys. Uh, so we sur used, well, yeah, so we did engagement surveys and so we, we do okay. them every year. And kind of, and so to your point, tracking where our engagement metrics and productivity metrics okay. were at that time. And then once we do the survey again with a third party, of course, our numbers were much better. <laughs> Very nice. And, but uh, I do think focus groups, um, I do think just having some focus groups, maybe for me, sometimes having the survey just yearly is too long. It's too long because if you need to adjust, yeah. you've allowed Not a whole working, year yeah. exactly to go by. Yeah. So for me, I think the mechanism would really be to speak to your people. Again, that, that creates the personalization. Have some focus groups where you sit down with the folks, try to have a mix up and then ask them, is this working? Is it not working? <laughs> How can we change it? <laughs> One thing I will say, which I, don't, I mean, I find this interesting because a lot of folks don't really like, I, I don't know why organizations are always fearful to sit with employees and acts when they're the ones that are experiencing it. But what I will say is they have no issues for sharing. I have never gone to a focus group where it was like crickets. I, every focus group I'm having to say, okay, stop. <laughs> Let me reel you back in. This is the topic because people yeah. want to share. Yeah. They want to tell you this is working, this is not working. Mm -hmm. And if you sit in a room with them long enough, they'll let you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, did you get any resistance? 
from like the management team? Absolutely. Like someone like, we're not here to play. Absolutely. Here to work. There you go. There's no, there shouldn't be work and play. And so, of course, my job was to, and I'm open to that. That's a part of the job because your job is to really let them, as I always say, I just want you to trust me. And that's where it comes to building this relationship. So I can't guarantee you of what the outcome is going to be because we're hopeful of that. But I can guarantee you that if it doesn't work, we will pivot and kind of move in the next direction. Okay. But nothing beats a failure but a try. That's my line all the time. Nothing beats a failure but a try. So if we don't try it, we won't know if it's going to work. And so my ask of them is as the subject matter expert, let me run with it. I'll take the blows if it doesn't work. And if it does well, then I can also take the pat on the back. But the job <laughs> is for us to at least be able to try it. And I think... Because I've already built that reputation of being reliable, of being a team player, of being accountable. Because if it doesn't work, I'm the first one to say, hey, I thought it was a good idea, but it doesn't work. Yeah. Can we go in another direction? So I think that they can respect that. And then I think for me, to give them the peace of mind, it was more of having the resources. Because I realized that their resistance was an indication of their personal fear. A lot of them aren't tech savvy. They felt like this would be difficult. I'm not on my phones. Like my kids and my grandkids are doing this. I don't know how to do this. So it was more of the speaking from a fair perspective. And my job, again, was to pull it out of them and let them know that you can do it. It's easy. If a two-year-old mm -hmm. <laughs> can do it, we can do it as professionals. <laughs> let me ask you, like, uh, in this situation, uh, I'm, I'm finding this, oh, oh, I don't know, it's like, uh, uh, this is not the word. I was looking for a translation, like, uh, Can you connect here in America this kind of games to uh, like pay for performance or short term incentives using this kind of games points like they do because they can pay you something right now and then if you're uh, uh, less than your uh, performance, I can reduce it. Can Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think of primarily what you're talking about works well in sales environments. So let's just say you have a sales team yeah. and so they have targets. That's where it's easier. So it, that works really in any environment where you have solid metrics that you can kind of track. So I wouldn't necessarily say that that would work for a role like mine because a lot of what I do is not quantifiable by numbers, okay. right? But if you're working in a call center environment, if you're a salesperson, so any role where there are actual targets that you can tie to it, absolutely, because then I would set it up as a leaderboard, and then you're able to kind of show this is the sales team, so let's just say we're working towards 500,000, we put the goal on the leaderboard, yeah. and then everyone can see how you're contributing to it and as it's coming down, and then to your point, we incentivize when you've reached that milestone. So the team that's hit it, then they get 20% or 15% as a bonus, whatever it is that you... Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to do in environments where you have quantifiable goals and objectives. It's a little bit harder when those goals are subjective because mm -hmm. then what are you measuring against to be able to incentivize? But maybe you can start with sales and then you have the results to show the board and say, oh, oh absolutely. Yes, do for the rest absolutely. of the yeah, yeah, Great but suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> like this, uh, I think we need to become subjected to objective. Let me try to explain with something actually i think that uh the service here in america uh, understand me like i'm putting my heart in this table right now <laughs> the service is not so good because you were telling like 5 p.m oh it's my time forget about it, it's not the, it's not about it like when i see the service of course it's not all the Amer all the u.s mm -hmm. america like we are in the south american Juan was the time like emerson we are in america too please <laughs> we, we, we already were in america yeah. we are not here uh, right in america. <laughs> we already were in it. so uh, but when i see like this the service the service We talk about the prices, Atlanta, the, the minimum wage. So mm -hmm. we have problems before the situation. But think about the next, uh, like to put the next uh, total rewards in the next level. Mm -hmm. When you see this part, we can use, for example, a net promoter score. Okay. Like to evaluate this guy is serving me in of a course. restaurant. Or, uh, this could be something to connect with the payment. Like if your store has a good net promoter like mm -hmm. this, uh, you can improve or you, you can receive some uh, a kind of short-term incentive. But it's not a sales guy. Right. It's, it's like premiação. Yeah. How can I say? Uh, it's just it's a it's short-term. Like a bonus. A bonus. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a bonus. So I, I think the games could be good with it. Of Have course. you ever tested something like this? Not bonuses. 
Definitely not. And I think so. Here's where it gets tricky. So in my world, when we say pay for performance and short and long term incentives, it is really for a high performer. Mm -hmm. So not someone that's just coming and showing up to do their job. We're talking about the person that's really trying to take their career or whatever that is to kind of the next level. Mm -hmm. And so we consider them to be a high performer, a high flyer, which is a little bit different because if you're a high flyer, so thinking of, you know, a high performer like myself, that is not going to incentivize you. So if you think of what you will pay out from a gamification perspective, it's not going to be tangible enough for that to make a difference. So a lot of times when we think of true short-term and long-term incentives that are tied to some type of goal, we want that to be outside of this platform because it's really just going to be applicable to a small subset of your population. The majority of the folks are going to be great at what they do, but they're just going to be great at what they do. They're never going to want or even mm-hmm. desire to go above and beyond. But you are going to have the next CEO, the next CFO, the ne- like they're in your organization. And so it's my job to identify who they are. But now for me to, for it to be meaningful for you, it's not going to be in that platform. It would truly have to be an incentive. And I know for, for us um, in the United States, we typically use um, money and it's usually a percentage of your base pay. Mm-hmm. But then it has to be meaningful because we're, yeah. you know, we want you to know that, hey, How you're much? doing this, but this is what it is. And so usually that works in that environment. I think from a gamification perspective, your bonus example would work. absolutely. Yeah. So we just wanted it to be for everyone and kind of not high price. That kind of works. But I think... When I think of gamification, we don't want it to really be the cutthroat part of it that comes with Mm -hmm. high performers and kind of what the incentives are around that. Because there are a subset of employees that are motivated by money and that's not going to cut it for them. And because we wanted really the gamification part to be fun and inclusive, it's not meant to really make a division between someone that's going to kill it and somebody that's just comfortable with kind of coming in and rocking it. So you have to be very careful with Mm -hmm. how you incentivize because you don't want it to be a turnoff for the person that's not hitting it out of the park. I Mm -hmm. got it. Yeah. You were talking and you made me remember that Hinne told me that the company, there was a game that simulate job positions. You'd like to be a CEO for one day? You can play right now. And then you... uh, Truck driver. Yeah, like this. Correct. And you feel all those stress and all the stuff (laughs) that follow with this job position. Because, of course, I wouldn't be like much money I can do. But this is the good part, you see. But (laughs) we have a strong, a huge that you... Uh-huh. Can't find. And there's a way to your point. So when you've identified your potentials, that's what you do. You put them through training, but now your modules kind of emulate where they're going to be. Because remember, yeah. they haven't done it yet. So in your mind, you're really looking at past performance to indicate whether or not they're going to be successful, but they don't know what it looks like because they haven't been there. Well, you may not want to just turn this person into a CEO with no experience, but if you have this simulation process where they're going through it so they get to see, oh, Maybe I'm yeah. not ready, or maybe I am. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. um, you know, either yeah. way. So totally agree. It's so good. you think if we had this kind of gamification in schools, for example, so I can try on yeah, different prof- um, professions, that then we would have less frustrated people. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah. company, Absolutely. You know, and people in the wrong careers. Because a lot yeah. of the folks that I coach, that's the problem. It's not that the jo- they're in the wrong job. The yeah. job is not really suited to who they are as an individual. But you don't know that. And then again, it depends on where you're coming from. Because I think of coming from the Bahamas, our, what we think of from careers is a doctor, a lawyer, or an accountant. Yeah. So when I told my family that I was going to do HR, my dad said no. Literally, my dad wanted me to be a lawyer. He already had it figured out. I'm buying your law firm. You're going to be a lawyer. You have the gift of gab. You're going to be a lawyer. And literally, I did it. I did get my law degree from FIU. I just never used it because I knew that there was no alignment with me in that job. Like literally, in every class, I would dread that. But trying to tell my Bahamian family, (laughs) that I'm going to do HR, and in their minds, HR, what is that? Because again, (laughs) in the Bahamas, you you, I mean, fast forward today, we have great HR professionals. But when I would have started this 20, 25 years ago, no one knew what HR was. We had payroll people that made sure that people got paid, but there was no strategic HR. Mm -hmm. So in my dad's mind, it's like, 
oh my God, I sent you to college for you to do what? <laughs> what are you going to do with this? And I feel like a lot of folks, depending on your culture, and where you come from, even your experience, you could even be American. It depends on what you were exposed to. You may not even know of how many careers are out there. Even with my husband, he's going through a transition right now where he's looking for a new job. And I'm throwing, because I know him, I know his personality. I'm like, have you thought about this? Have you thought? A lot of it he's never even heard of. Because again, his viewpoint of what careers are was limited to his experience. He's mm -hmm. also from the career and St. Thomas. So a lot of these roles, he didn't even know existed until now mm -hmm. I'm coming and saying, oh, check this out and check this out. And to your point, all of my folks go through personality assessment so they can figure out this is kind of how I'm wired. And now what careers work best with this type mm -hmm. of, you know, with this type of person, this type of human, because a lot of times folks are in the wrong jobs and that's why they're frustrated. It's not that they're a bad employee. It's that <laughs> this is not their strong suit. They're not and supposed so, to be doing this. Correct. Uh -huh. Correct. Yeah, it's like my mother, I was working with marketing in an industry like normal, of course, and then I went to a consultant company like us, and what is, what are you, what are you going to do, like, and I, tell, I, I told her, like, it's, it's something with HR, it's compensation, and she was like, it's not something with drugs or something. <laughs> <laughs> Emerson, what is it? What are you doing? Yeah. And it was, no, man, be calm. And uh, let me try to explain to you and then you go. Absolutely. And then you even think of compensation. I will probably say, and I think I can say this confidently, probably half of the U.S. workers have no idea what their total compensation is. They have no idea. They know yeah. that they got a check. Oh, yeah. But uh -huh. really understanding, Just pay, yeah. I can tell you, because none of my family and friends know, every <laughs> open enrollment period, I'm on the phone with all of my loved ones. And it's frustrating, but I've learned to let it go. Because I tell my husband, this is the only career I've had. And he still doesn't understand. <laughs> but he like, doesn't. It is complicated, especially yeah. from a compensation. When you start getting into equity and oh, 401k yeah. and... Cool. and Short term and long term and bonus and I'm like oh it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes lot. we make offers and we don't explain that, so it, it's hard for an, an employee. Imagine for a newcomer that has yeah. receives an offer. I, I have a friend that knows that I work with compensation and she called me one day and like, can you help me? Can you please help me? She was entry level and she received a, a really nice offer like with flexible pay, so she had. Uh, more or less equity on depending on her of uh, style of compensation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but she had no idea how that works like options and you know uh, long-term incentives I don't know how that works how, how am I supposed to choose one of these options like oh of yeah. course and I'm thinking even to piggyback on your offer do you know how many folks don't? So if you're thinking you're in the job market, you have multiple offers. How do you make a decision between the oh, two? Yeah. A lot of folks, especially in the U.S., they only look at base pay. So it's this job is going to pay me 70K. This job is going to pay me 80K. I'm going to go with the 80K. I'm like, no, you're not. I'm like, let's talk about uh -huh. this. This is why I live in compensation. How many PTO days do you have? I'm like, PTO is money. It's paid time off. That's what it stands for. I'm like, so if I'm going to make... 70k and I can have 20 PTO days and then I can go for an organization and make 75 and 10 that's not an even trade off for me yeah. Oh, yeah. depending on who you are so someone like me who values flexibility I want to spend time with my family that's a different balance then you think of medical dental vision well at my husband's job they pay for that at 100% at my job we don't so if he's looking at an offer even now that he's in the market he has to compare those medical dental and vision oh, yeah. rates because if your other company does not pay for him then now you have an expense that you didn't have before and also the skills you're gonna learn and the opportunities you might have in one Absolutely. or other job. Absolutely. Like, is there room for growth? And mm -hmm. I always say that with my clients. I figure out, depending on your level, because remember, some people, that's not, they're in their sweet spot. So not everyone is looking to kind of get to the next level in their career in terms of upward mobility. Oh, yeah. Some people can get value and purpose in other ways of their job. And so I get that. But to your point, that absolutely does also make a difference. Yeah. Sometimes it's it's a good decision to, to receive less oh, and, and have more opportunities in the long term. Of course. Even lateral moves. Like I've made, so I think of my experience at the YMCA. When I first joined four and a half years ago, it was a lateral move for me. At that point, I wasn't ready for a lateral move. I felt like I wanted to be at the next level, right? Right? Mm -hmm. So I struggled. But to your point, I took the job because of my manager. That's literally, I met her and I knew that I needed autonomy. I needed somebody that was going to let me just run wild because I have a lot of things going on in this brain of mine. So I needed somebody that was going to trust me that I could do the job, but also allow me to be creative and just oh, be yeah. autonomous and do all of the things. So on paper, 
it didn't look like a good offer. But I fast forward to now, this is the first job in my life that I've had over two and a half years, which says a lot because I'm because of what I do. I tap out very easily because I can do this with my eyes closed and it takes a lot for me to be engaged, right? So in a lot of my jobs, after I kind of mastered the comp part of it, then I'm like, there has to be more. I never thought I would be able to say I've been at an organization for four and a half years because I used to brag about kind of I'm two and a half in and then I'm on to the next, right? But all of what we implemented actually worked for me. It feels like home. It feels like a community. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, I don't feel like it's work. That's why when people say, how do you do this with a, your business? And, because it doesn't feel like work. None of them feel like work. I enjoy doing it. I do it all the time. Like I work every weekend. I don't work nine hours a day, but it's not because there's a pressure. It's because... I know that the people that I serve, I love them, I want to be able to do it and I'm not thinking about the clock because to your point, mm -hmm. I can be at the World at Work conference and I'm not worrying about work. <laughs> See the difference? <laughs> like I'm taking this week off and work is going to handle itself and I have the, you know, the ability to be able to do that which is now so when I get back in there, if I want to go hard for seven days straight, I can do that because I have kind of the balance. The balance mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. yeah. From your perspective, so you already talked about and knowing our audience and, for example, choosing a specific public to begin with, for example, sales. But uh, for the companies that have never heard or thought about uh, gamification or applying gamification to their context, context um, which are the babe steps? So <laughs> how should we begin with? Of course. Start with HR. So I HR and your leadership, because usually HR are the cheerleaders of usually most organizations. So they're usually the ones that's running with the compliance, running with the training, making sure that everyone's doing what they're supposed to do. So usually from an HR perspective, we're the ones that are voluntold, right? <laughs> so we don't volunteer, we voluntold and they tell us that we have to do it. So I would say if you're de if you're company has an HR department, start with them. Mm -hmm. If they don't, you want to start with leaders, because why? If you can get yeah. the buy in from the top, mm -hmm. then it trickles down to everybody else in their direct reports. So you mm -hmm. start with your managers. You start with like your frontline managers. You start with your oh, C-suite folks. So you basically force them. <laughs> and that's a part of management, right? Remember, it's the other duties as a sign that we love to throw on those job descriptions in the US. It's, it's our way of saying, we're gonna make you do things that you don't wanna do. <laughs> well, that's one of them. So <laughs> you make your managers do But I mean, you want them to do it because remember, that's how the buy-in is gonna work. If I see my manager engaging and being a part of this, more than likely I am going to engage and be a part of it. So you want to, and I think it's easy to get involvement when you can tie it back to the why. A lot of times we don't say why. We just roll out as HR and, and especially okay. comp professionals. We're great at just pushing things to folks, but we don't ever tie it back to why we're doing this for people to understand. And a lot of times folks are resistant to change, resistant to change, I'm sorry, because they don't understand. They don't understand how is it going to impact me or how is it not going to impact me. They don't have an opportunity to be a part of the journey. It's almost like you just wake up and someone says, this is happening, run with it. If you bring them along the journey, so to your point, we created a task force as we, we were building this out. So it wasn't just HR. We had professionals from every department that were a part of this team. Like we were the ambassadors. So we built mm -hmm. it together where they could say, Sherelle. I don't think that's going to work for my team. Maybe not. We talked about incentives. Do you prefer gift cards? Do you think yeah. money may work? Do you think more time off? Well, a lot of the managers could give you that information. And so now when it's rolled out, it's not as if uh, they, because that's how they feel. They rolled it out and throw it. It's we. We did this. Yes. And now they can say we were a part of it and be the champions to kind of roll out throughout the organization. So mm -hmm. start with them. <laughs> Sherelle, uh, your eyes uh, shine when you talk about uh, what do you do? Do you know? I've heard it a few times. Do you know it? When we finish with the podcast, I'm going to let her know this is what she needs to do because she's a lot more comfortable sitting here talking with you guys compared to earlier when she was speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. It's a complete 180 seeing her now. Like She looks like she's completely comfortable. Yeah. With what she Wow. And I would Thank stay you. here. I would stay here <laughs> talking to you the whole evening. Because right? it, I love it. it. Yeah. Well, let's not be strangers. Let's do yeah. this again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, we are staying here until Saturday. So <laughs> <laughs> why not? I'll change a ticket. I'll change a flight. Why not? <laughs> wow. I love it. Like was, um, of course, we don't know anything when we were talking about what kind of presentation, what kind of session would like to to become a podcast, an episode. 
and then we saw your na like uh, your subject here gamification and oh this one could be but who is Shorel? Maybe like American, like uh, to speak of Portuguese uh, with Brazilian guys. I don't know, like, <laughs> uh, and it was. But take a look. That's what I love. We about have it. a beautiful episode with you. Of course, mm -hmm. that's yeah. what I liked. It was different. I mean, I think that's what really got me engaged. Because I go, you know, everyone in America is kind of doing this, and <laughs> you know, you've seen one, you've seen all. But I'm like, oh wow, this is a different audience. <laughs> You're gonna have a different perspective because the only thing I know about Brazil is that the people are beautiful just by seeing <laughs> them. I'm like, everybody looks like they work out and eat healthy, and I'm like, what is this place with all beautiful people? <laughs> but outside of that, I don't understand the mechanisms and how does work really happen in other countries and I think that that helps to even make me a better professional because yeah. I don't only serve Americans there are I mean I think of our population we have a lot of folks from Caribbean descent we mm -hmm. have a lot of folks that are Hispanic all all over we have a lot of folks that are of Asian descent wow. so again but you don't think about that when you're building you know your mm -hmm. comp models and you're just thinking the way you learn it but now all of this is opening up my eyes to different perspectives and kind of this may be some of the challenges it may not be the information it could be just a language barrier things that we really don't even think about <laughs> yeah Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here with you and, and my my friends here doing this. Uh, Absolutely, it's been a pleasure. And now you're our friends. We're new friends. Yeah, yes. good. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk more about it. Like, then change some messages from Brazil and uh, I know maybe go to Brazil to do this presentation. Oh, of course. There. Of course. Now you're. Would like to go there? Now you're talking. You <laughs> <laughs> now you're talking. I would okay. love to, and then so maybe you talk already to have them. a place to stay on. So awesome. you are invited to stay. You both, uh, yeah. perfect. And then At maybe home. we have some other um, Brazilian, so maybe other HR Brazilian yeah. folks. That we yeah, talk absolutely. About. So this is how it works in my end, then I can come and say, oh, well, this is how, and then we can bounce ideas off of each other. Maybe even have a Q and A. Like yeah. let's throw some questions <laughs> out there. Listen. My brain. The uh, sky is the limit. <laughs> but I need to say something. I am expecting to be invited to go to the Bahamas as well. Oh, of course. So, no. Oh, hands down. <laughs> no pressure. Hands down. No pressure. I try to go like three or four times a year, so I will give you dates. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, let a, just uh, uh, let a, some words in Portuguese. A gente vê vocês, ó, no próximo episódio. Tá muito maneiro isso aqui. Olha o privilégio que nós tivemos de conhecer a Shurel. Então, fica com a gente conectado que tem muita coisa vindo por aí. É isso aí. Valeu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to said. I don't know what it was, but it sounded great. <laughs> Até o próximo, hein? Tchau. Tchau. Bye, bye.